Hi, and welcome to the introduction to Fritz Lang's Metropolis, a 1927 film coming out of Germany. Um, my name is Quinn, and so I will be your host as your buddy Quinn today. Uh, I want to spend uh, some time introducing this film before you watch it. it. If you haven't seen Metropolis, you will probably find that this is a film unlike other films that you've ever seen. Uh, it can be uh, quite a remarkable viewing experience though. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about silent films uh, so that uh, we can understand how silent films worked and, and, and what role they played in cinema. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Germany in the 1920s uh, when this film was, was made and the context around its production. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Fritz Lang, the director as well, uh, and uh, some of the choices that he made in the film. Uh, including uh, some of the innovations in cinematography, uh, some of the themes and some things that I'd just like you to watch out for as you watch the film. So uh, prior to 1928, uh, when the technology was developed where uh, you could record sound alongside the film, uh, all films were silent. We, we, we call that the silent era. There were some films that also remained silent after 1928. It took a while for the so-called talkie films uh, to take over the industry. Uh, but uh, this is a film that uh, is made at the height of the silent era in 1927. Silent films use intertitles uh, to express essential dialogue. Uh, an intertitle is, is a slide uh, in between scenes in which the words of, of one of the characters is, is written. So you can get a sense of what they're saying. Uh, once you start to uh, see a film with intertitles, it, it flows actually quite naturally. Uh, but not everything can be expressed with intertitles. It becomes quite choppy if you uh, include intertitle slides uh, all the time. And so uh, much of the communication in a silent film is, is due to the acting. And as a result, much of the acting in many silent films is what we might uh, see today as overacting. Uh, essentially acting in ways that express emotion or that reveal the thoughts of the character uh, in very obvious ways so that you don't have to have dialogue to express what's going on. Uh, viewers of a silent film would not experience silence. Uh, there was always a musical score to accompany the film. And the musical score was uh, usually tailored specifically that for that film and uh, could also be used to convey meaning. So it could convey the emotion or uh, the suspense or other things that uh, the director wanted to convey. Uh, typically, orchestras would uh, participate in the, the cinema proper, so they would actually play the score to the film as it was um, being uh, screened. And uh, you may not expect that theaters would be overly grand during the silent era, uh, but in fact, many of them were. So going to the theater during the silent area was often a really remarkable experience. The theaters were much grander in many places than, than they are today. Uh, it was a musical experience, it was a social experience. People would boo and cheer and, and uh, this, the silence in the film uh, gave them a little bit of an opportunity to be very expressive during the film. So it was really quite a, a remarkable social as well as a, an artistic experience to go to a silent film. In the 1920s, uh, Germany was coming right out of what was known as the Great War. So the Great War, what we uh, often now call World War I, uh, lasted from the summer of 1914 all the way to the fall of 1918. And the destruction of this war was unparalleled in history. Uh, so many people died. Uh, the technologies to kill uh, were developed during this war in ways that people hadn't previously imagined. And Germany was the principal protagonist uh, of World War I. The war was a period where there was a race uh, for technological innovation. Uh, it was a matter of survival in many cases. Uh, it was also a period where there was a race for mass production. Uh, the Great War was the first time airplanes were really introduced as a tool of war. Uh, the tank was introduced, developed in part by the, the British. Poisonous gases uh, were used to devastating effect, you know, particularly in the trenches on the Western Front. And by the fall of 1918, um, when uh, Germany surrendered, uh, the country was really devastated. Uh, in 1919, 
Germany signed uh, what was known as the Treaty of Versailles uh, after negotiations at the Paris Peace Conference. And the Treaty of Versailles has become a little bit infamous in history as uh, being quite onerous on Germany. Uh, it called upon Germany to accept the damage caused um, by the war, uh, to disarm completely, to pay war reparations to the victors. And uh, this really put a lot of constraints on the German economy. Uh, from the end of the war uh, until the rise of Hitler in 1933, Germany was governed by what was known as the Weimar Republic. And in those early years in the 1920s, Germany was in a really deep crisis. It was in a crisis politically, economically, and socially. There were severe food shortages, uh, resentment at the terms of the post-war settlement, and extremely high levels of inflation. Uh, the Nazi party, uh, the, what became known as the Nazi party was formed in 1920. Uh, and uh, Hitler even led an attempted coup against the, the Weimar government in 1923, which landed him in jail. Uh, but the grievances that, that he represented as early as 1923 were to continue throughout the 1920s. So Metropolis was, was written and then filmed in the middle of the 1920s. Uh, it was filmed uh, over about a year and a half period, 1925, 1926. And that was a period when the Weimar Republic had just started to stabilize somewhat. Uh, the economy started to grow. Uh, it was a period of renewed industrialization, and there were some really interesting attempts to develop a social welfare system uh, to, to protect workers. Uh, so many people had died in the war. Uh, there was a need to really restart the economy, uh, a lot of pressure to really use people essentially as components of machines in mass production. And so a social welfare system was starting to be developed. This was also a period that was uh, known throughout much of Europe, but particularly in Germany as a, a period of cultural renaissance. Uh, the arts started to flourish, literature really started to take off, and uh, cinema also took off. And so Metropolis is, is representative of this peak period of uh, Weimar Republic cultural renaissance in the latter part of the 1920s. The Great Depression is going to hit the world in 1929, and so uh, Germany's economic woes will uh, come back, right, in the next few years, but Metropolis was filmed before that. Uh, Metropolis, as a result, I think, has some strong themes of mechanization, of abusive labor practices, uh, of class division between the elites who profit from the growing economy, and in, in Metropolis' case, they live very high in the city, and the workers, who are really being worked to death, essentially, live down below in the depths in what's called the workers city in, in metropolis uh, after the film was released some criticized the film for its pro-worker messages uh, this was a period of anti-communism in germany uh, and some people thought that the the pro-labor uh, message of it uh, was sympathetic to communism although uh, i think its messages deviate from the communist ideology in many ways um, certainly uh, you don't get a, a strong sense that in metropolis um, a worker's revolt is necessarily a good thing. Uh, let's talk now just for a few minutes about the director Fritz Lang. Uh, Fritz Lang was born in Austria. Uh, he was a successful filmmaker at a very young age. In fact, by the time we get to Metropolis, his grandest and most expensive film, he's still in his, his 30s. He had already had a couple of successful movies uh, in Germany prior to this point, but this was going to be his big movie, the one that uh, was going to, to really shake cinema to its foundations. Uh, he married uh, a woman named Thea von Harbu, and this was a very productive, creative partnership. Uh, they co-wrote uh, most of Lang's movies from the 1920s uh, all the way up to the early 1930s, although they ended up uh, divorcing uh, after von Harbu started uh, to sympathize with the Nazi party. Fritz Lang himself was considered uh, quite anti-Nazi. Uh, his films had been perceived previously as critical of the Nazi party. And his mother was actually Jewish before she converted to Catholicism, although she did that before his birth. So uh, according to the, the rules of the Nazi regime, um, he would be considered Jewish, right? And subject to anti-Jewish laws. And so he, he fled the Nazi re regime. Um, divorcing von Harbu. 
by the middle of the 1930s, he's going to move to Hollywood, um, and uh, he ultimately uh, makes uh, quite a few movies in Hollywood, more than 20 movies uh, in his time in America uh, during World War II and, and beyond. Um, he's most notable in Hollywood for uh, the influences that he had on the development of, of the genre of film noir. Uh, turning to the production uh, of Metropolis, uh, filming took place over uh, about a year and a half, as I mentioned, uh, and then it was released in 1927. Uh, the film was, was quite influenced by uh, Fritz Lang's first visit to Manhattan in New York. Uh, he first visited Manhattan in 1924. And at this period of time, Manhattan was uh, a growing city of skyscrapers, uh, unlike uh, most any other place in the world. And that, that feeling of walking in between skyscrapers uh, in Manhattan really influenced Lang. And uh, we start to see the visual implications of that uh, in Metropolis. The film uh, itself uh, went way over budget. It went more than three, three times over budget. It, it uh, essentially uh, bankrupted the production company. Um, it uh, cost the equivalent of, uh, it's, it's hard to calculate the exact number, but it would be certainly well over $50 million today. So it was a, definitely a big budget production. There were a couple of, of innovations. One was a very extensive use of miniature sets of the city. And there are parts in this film where you see what must be miniatures of this grand city, but there is life in them, right? There are people walking in them, there are cars and other things traveling in them. And this was accomplished through the use of a complex system of mirrors that made it look like people um, who were actually being filmed, um, but then shrunk essentially into the miniatures or walking through those miniature sets. The film was considered upon its release really quite long, um, testing the patience of people. It was about two and a half hours. And so it was cut down considerably without Lang's permission, and he was really quite furious about this. Uh, its reception um, at the time was one of um, a great appreciation in terms of the, the cinematography, in terms of the sets, um, the production values that were considered very high. But the message for many critics at the time was considered quite uh, naive and potentially quite simp simplistic. For some, it was also considered to be too religious of a film. And we'll talk for a few minutes about why that might be the case. Uh, the version of Metropolis that you're currently most likely to see, and the one that I would recommend if you can get it, uh, is a 2010 restoration. Uh, most of the time in the past century that Metropolis has, has been screened, it has been one of these uh, spliced and diced uh, versions. But uh, in the early part of this century, a, uh, a, an original copy of the film, uh, the full film, was found in a, a museum in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. And it was used as the primary film for a 2010 restoration. Uh, not all of the film uh, it, it exists anymore, uh, but we have about 95% of it. And so when you watch the 2010 restoration, what you'll see is uh, that in those few missing scenes, there'll be some additional intertitles that try to explain what scene is missing, just so that um, you, you don't lose any of the plot. Uh, so don't be surprised when, when you do see them. Um, the film uses these uh, very elaborate set pieces, and uh, it uses a, a lot of extras. So uh, not all of the, the primary actors in this film are professional actors. Uh, the, the father, um, uh, in the film who plays the ruler of Metropolis was a very well-known German actor, but many of them were not. And uh, there were a lot of, of child extras. In fact, uh, hundreds of, of people from poor districts of Berlin um, allowed Fritz Lang to use their children as extras in the film. Uh, children play an important role in this film and, and they're often portrayed as, as uh, the poor huddled masses. And so you'll get a sense uh, of, of that as you watch it. The working conditions for the actors and actresses uh, in the film were also very difficult. So Bridget Helm, uh, who plays Maria, 
uh, is, uh, I think she does a wonderful job. She's a very important uh, piece of this movie. But she uh, reports that she was dragged by her hair. Uh, in one scene, you, you can see that if you pay attention. Uh, her dress catches fire in another scene, right? And uh, almost burns her. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to figure out which scene that is as well. Uh, at one point, she also faints because of the lack of air. Um, she is uh, in a robot suit for a, a portion of the movie and uh, has to be rescued from that, that suit. Uh, there are also some water scenes in this film and the water uh, scenes uh, were filmed over many, many days. The water was kept very cold and, and uh, it, it was not a very healthy environment. Fritz Lang as a director was known as someone who was very rigid, uh, who was a perfectionist and uh, didn't treat his actors and actresses particularly well. Um, but he, his goal was to, to really try to get the, the right shot. Um, and uh, you probably see a little bit of both of, of, of those impacts in this film. Uh, some key themes in the film that I want you to watch out for. Uh, this is a, a science fiction film. Uh, it's probably considered the grandest of all of the silent uh, period science fiction films. Um, it is set at an unknown year in the future. Some people have speculated on the year, uh, 100 years after its production, for example. Uh, but uh, I don't know that we, we have a really good handle on what year it was supposed to be, be set in. Um, the main protagonist is uh, a character named Freder. He is the son of the ruler of Metropolis. Um, the ruler of Metropolis uh, rules from a majestic building uh, known as the New Tower of Babel. And uh, early in the film, we, we start to see the potential conflict that can result when you have a spoiled son of uh, the ruler of Metropolis uh, representing the powerful classes um, who sees the workers toil away and uh, recognizes that there's this, this massive uh, gap in their experience, uh, working all day long and his experience playing all day long. So Frederick, the spoiled son, begins to see that the city has a dark side and over time, his character development uh, is such that he starts to take on the role of an advocate for the workers. His counterpart on the worker's side uh, is a female character named Maria. Uh, we first meet Maria early in the film when she brings a group of workers' children uh, up in the city to see how the upper classes live. Uh, Freder is stunned by her beauty and um, wants to know more about who she is and what she represents. And this leads him into a journey where he becomes more and more sympathetic to the workers and more at odds with his powerful father. Uh, the visuals of this film are, are quite remarkable. Uh, we don't really have visuals like this anymore. Uh, they were heavily influenced by several artistic movements at the time. So Art Deco uh, would be uh, a main influence on the way that the sets were constructed. There was also the Bauhaus School of Design, which was very important in, in Berlin at this time. Cubism, right, coming out of Picasso and, and, and others um, who were starting to think about lines and abstractions uh, come across here. And so this, this film is is thought of as a representative film of what we now call German Expressionism. German, German Expressionism peaked in Berlin in the 1920s. And it was known as a movement that was comfortable with crazy angles, with the interplay of light and shadow, with moody atmospherics. And in terms of topics, uh, German Expressionism often dealt with intellectual topics and sometimes uh, individual insanity. Uh, that was a common theme in German Expressionism, and that becomes transferred also into social uh, insanity or collective insanity, which we do see uh, bits of both of those actually in, in this film. Metropolis is also well known because it has extensive um, and uh, deliberate Christian references. So the film is influenced by the New Testament in the sense that uh, Jesus was a mediator uh, for men uh, between God and man in the New Testament. And uh, we see this theme of mediation between the elite and between the workers uh, in, in this film as well. Uh, it's, it's influenced heavily by the book of Revelation, um, written by John, the last book of the New Testament. 
And it's very graphic, symbolic descriptions of the end of days. Um, Babylon is a major theme in this film as a corrupt and evil city, uh, as is the story from the Old Testament of the Tower of Babel. Uh, I think that the, the robot transformation of Maria is, is really something to behold in Metropolis, and it's, it's one of the highlights of the film. Uh, Bridget Helm does a remarkable job essentially being double cast as uh, Maria, the good Maria, and then as the robot Maria. Um, the, the, the good Maria represents in many ways the female nurturing mother figure, and then uh, another way that women are sometimes viewed is represented by this this robotic um, evil Maria, which is the sedu seductive temptress uh, that she plays in her robot role. Uh, note that uh, Freder, uh, the main protagonist, also comes across uh, early on as a potential visionary. He has an early vision in the first part of the film. He is visiting the workers' city uh, and sees a, an industrial accident, which he then imagines as uh, machines essentially eating the workers as a vision of Moloch, uh, which starts to signal that he has the potential vision to see things as they really are, right? Uh, which uh, the upper classes are often blinded to and begins to start to transform himself uh, into the role of a mediator uh, between the workers and the, uh, the elite. So th there's a, a social class mediation role going on here. And then uh, we, we also start uh, to see quite deliberately and potentially simplistically in this film, uh, mediation um, being done uh, with the heart as well, right? And between uh, the different parts of the human soul. So I hope that you, you enjoy Metropolis. Uh, the 2010 version uh, is uh, about two and a half hours long. So you may uh, choose to watch it in one sitting, you may choose to break it up but I hope that uh, it, it's a, a fun experience for you and that you'll start to see how German expressionism ultimately impacts uh, other movies that develop in the 1930s and 1940s in places like Hollywood, both because of Fritz Lang's influence, but also because uh, of the broader themes of, of light and shadow that Metropolis introduces.